Good evening, my brothers and my sisters, and welcome tonight to Wednesdays in the Word. I am Reverend John Kenny, the pastor of Third Baptist Church, and I'm grateful to have you with us on tonight. I hope and pray that you have had a wonderful beginning of the week. Amen. I hope and pray you're at the hump day now and that as you climb over this hump and you begin to step into the next few days of the week, we hope and pray that you have a uh, better ending of your week than the beginning may have been. Amen. So we're excited that you're with us tonight for study. We're excited that we have this opportunity to study around the word of the Lord. So I hope and pray you have your Bible, your cell phone, your iPad, your notepad, whatever you need to have tonight um, to join us in this our virtual time of study. I want to encourage you tonight to use the chat box. Fill in the sections in the chat box. Let your questions be raised. Let your comments be heard. You know, let us know exactly um, how the teaching is helping you or not helping you or impacting you or not impacting you. Share with us as we journey together in this thing that we call faith. Amen and amen. So let's go ahead and let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. We honor your name and we bless you for the goodness and the kindness and the grace that you've extended unto all of us. We seek you now in this time of study that you might get the glory in this time we've been given. Bless us now, O oh God. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen and amen. And my brothers and my sisters, I'm so grateful that you're with us tonight. Um, we are beginning a conversation now looking at something that's important and relevant to all of our lives, something that's important to every believer and that is a word called prayer. Prayer is our communication with God. Prayer is our spiritual lifeline that we have been thrown, if you will, to God. Prayer is spiritual oxygen. It feeds our souls. Prayer keeps us in constant contact and conversation and communication and connection to our God through the spirit of the living God. Without prayer, every believer will falter by the wayside. A life without prayer is a life without power. A life without prayer is a life without power. Amen. And I want to encourage you tonight as we begin this conversation to, to uh, uh, further deepen your discipline of prayer, further deepen your commitment to prayer. Uh, as a church, as a church, we have several opportunities for us to gather for prayer. We have our Thursday mornings, Thursday morning prayer call at 7 o'clock a.m. We have our first and fourth Sunday morning prayer call at 9 a.m. And we have our first Monday of the month prayer call at 12 o'clock noon. Amen. And I'll make sure that there is going to be the telephone number that you can call for those opportunities uh, in this lesson before we end tonight. Amen. So um, we want you to join us because we believe that prayer not only is important, but prayer still works. So, uh, so let's jump into our lesson tonight. Our lesson tonight is going to be looking at the power of prayer. And we're going to be looking at Acts chapter number 10. Acts chapter number 10. Um, and it's there where we discover this um, relationship that has now been uh, 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 formed, if you will, between Peter and Cornelius. Peter who was one of the early disciples. Peter was the one who walked out on water. Peter was the one who told Jesus that I'm with you. I'm, I'm never going to abandon you, only to abandon him. Peter was the one who was very impetuous and very impulsive and very, very spontaneous in his actions and in his uh, response to things. Peter was one of us, like some of us are, who tends to react before he responds, amen, because to respond to something means you got to give it some careful thought, but to react to something means I'm letting my feelings dictate what I do in the moment. So uh, in Acts chapter 10, Peter is coming into a place where Peter is having uh, this experience or this encounter with a man by the name of Cornelius. Now, what I want you to understand about Acts chapter number 10 
is Acts chapter number 10. It sets the stage, if you will, for the barrier breaking purpose of the church. And this is why prayer is so important for the church. Because when you look at Acts chapter number 10, what you are witnessing is you are witnessing the social barriers that separated the people was now being attacked. What separated those who were in versus those who were out was now being torn down. What separated those who claimed a relationship with God and those who knew they had no relationship with God was now being torn down. Uh, what, what was happening here was that those who had a familiarity of a God of a previous tradition was now being forced to embrace a God who defied or went against their previous thought paradigm. Acts chapter number 10. And we find in Acts chapter number 10, a man by the name of Cornelius. So we begin at verse number one in Acts 10. It says in Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius. He was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. That's already, that's already a, 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 a red flag, if you will, because he was a Roman. And Romans didn't really give their lives or put their trust in God. Romans succumbed or adhered or submitted to Caesar, the, the Roman authority. So he was a, a, a Roman soldier who was a devout follower or fearful, fearer, fearer of, of God, if you will. He was a man who feared God, a God-fearing man, as was his entire house. So, um, and it says he gave regularly or generously to the poor, and he prayed regularly to God. One day he was praying, he was going to pray one day, and he had a vision. And in the vision, an angel of God came to him and said, Cornelius, verse four, Cornelius stared in terror. And he said, what is it, sir? He asked the angel, and the angel replied, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now, I want you to understand that. He was not of the Jewish faith tradition. He was not of the Jewish heritage. He was a Roman officer who feared God, who prayed to God. And the text says, the angel says, your, your prayers, listen, your, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. He was somebody on the outside, listen, who had just as much a uh, connection to God as those on the inside. He was somebody on the outside who was probably deemed more favorable than some folk on <laughs> the inside. <laughs> there it is right there. So he, he, He's informed of the fact that his offerings and prayers to God have been received. His prayers and gifts to the poor, rather, have been received. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives in or lives near the seashore. Okay, Cornelius gets the vision. Cornelius now has been instructed by the angel. First of all, your gift to the poor and your prayers have been received by God. Now I want you to send some men down to, to, to a place called Joppa. Send some men down there and find a man by the name of Simon Peter. He is staying with a man by the name of Simon the Tanner. Okay, Cornelius hears the instruction. Cornelius sends the men down to find Peter. Now, while the men are going to find Peter, Peter himself is now being uh, uh, instructed by God in a way that now disrupts, that disrupts Peter's foundation of faith that Peter is standing on. I want you to listen now to where it gets to verse number nine. The next day as Cornelius' messages were nearing the town, Peter went up on the rooftop to pray. Peter goes to pray to God. Remember, Cornelius his prayers had been received by God. In his prayer time, his prayers had been heard by God 
and been received by God, which suggests to us that his prayers were pleasing to God. Okay. He gets an angel sent to him. The angel instructs him where to go next. Send somebody down to find Simon Peter. Peter goes to pray the next day. He's praying. He sees the sky open up. That's around verse 11. Something like a large sheet set down with four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice says to Peter, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. Now, Peter says, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. Now, I want you to understand something significant here, because Peter is verbalizing with his mouth that he's clean. He's never done, he's never partaken or participated in anything unclean. He's never put within his body anything that would be deemed uh, unpure. But Peter is staying with a man by the name of Simon, who is a tanner. Now, why is that important? Because Peter is basing his purity, his holiness, on what he puts in him. But he's living with a man, staying with a man, staying in the house of a person who handles dead animals. The Levitical law says if anyone touches a dead animal, they are unclean. Wherever the dead animal is, that particular place is deemed unclean. So here is Peter verbalizing out of his mouth that he has never partaken in anything unclean. He's never put in himself anything unclean, but yet he is staying in an unclean environment. And that's why it's important to remember that Jesus says what defiles you is really not what you put in you. What defiles a person is what comes out of them. So Peter is living in a house that's deemed unclean, but yet he's telling God he's never participated in anything that is unclean. Isn't it funny how, how God now calls Peter? God summons Peter. God apprehends Peter, not in a holy place, but God apprehends Peter in an unclean place just to remind Peter of his own unclean behavior. Wherein Peter says, I have never done anything or participated or anything or eaten anything unclean and impure in my life. Now, go back to Simon, because when Cornelius, rather, because when Cornelius prays, we don't have any idea what Cornelius is praying for. We don't know that whatever, what, we have no idea what his prayers were. His prayers, the text says, were prayers that were received as an offering from God. Uh, he was committed to the Jewish practice of prayer. He was committed to the Jewish regiment of prayer, even though he was not Jewish by nature. What does that mean? That means that he was a person that was committed to prayer. He was committed to prayer, even though he was somebody who was not raised, if you will, in the tradition of the day, in the tradition of the culture. He, but he was somebody who was committed to having conversations with God. I, I, I dare suggest to you tonight that there are, there are people who are not in anybody's local fellowship who do more praying sometimes than the people who are committed to local fellowships do. There are people who may not belong to a church, who invest their lives and who commit their lives to prayer, probably more than some people who participate in the life of the church every day. Cornelius was not somebody that went to the synagogue, that went to church, but he was somebody who committed his life to prayer. Peter is somebody in the church, but yet and still has this disconnect, if you will, from his behaviors, his actions to his piety. He, he wanted to profess a certain level of piety or righteousness, but yet he was living in an environment that really and truly was not a 
righteous <laughs> environment, if you will. So Peter goes to pray. And during his prayer time, the Bible tells us that he was hungry and he wanted to eat. He, so, you know, he probably does what most of us do when we start praying in the middle and late at night and we're feeling tired or feeling hungry. You close your eyes and, and then the moment you close your eyes, you feel the spirit of slumberness to fall upon you. And, and before you know it, you are dozing off and you are napping, if you will. So that's the two contexts. Cornelius prayed every day. His prayers were received as an offering from God. Peter is going to pray. Peter gets apprehended by a vision in his prayer that challenges Peter's understanding, if you will, on some degree, his, his understanding of his own sinfulness. I don't eat anything unclean, but yet I'm living in a place that's not clean. Let's go back to the text. Verse 15, the voice says, do not call anything unclean if God has made it clean. That same vision was repeated to him three times. Ironically, he gets the vision three times. Ironically, it was three times he denied Jesus the first go round. So, some of us don't catch on the first time. <laughs> you ought to let yourself know tonight. That if, if, if you're somebody listening to me tonight, and, and 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 you struggle with you struggle with getting it right the first time. Peter lets us know tonight that there are some of us who just don't get it right the first go round. He he the first time when he denied Jesus three times. Jesus said before the cop, the uh, cop crows three times you can deny me. And at three subsequent intervals he said I don't know him. Here we have him again, getting the vision. I'm not unclean. The vision comes back again three times. The Lord had to remind him, yo, you, you're not what you think you are. Then the sheets were suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then the men sent by Cornelius, they found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, verse 19, as Peter was pulling or puzzling rather over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. I, I want to suggest when we talk about the power of prayer, I want to take the power of prayer tonight. Um, what we need to understand first is that when, when the men show up to Peter, the men show up to Peter in response to God's conversation with Cornelius. Cornelius gets information from God, instruction from God to go find Simon, Peter. I want to suggest tonight the first thing you have to understand about the power of prayer is that the power of prayer, the church will sometimes be an answer to somebody else's prayer. You don't never understand and we will never fully understand when God has put us in a position to be the answer to somebody else's prayer. The, the, the power of prayer simply says, not only does God respond to the church or to those who call on him, but God also responds to those who call on him by enlisting the church's participation. That the power of prayer not only has individual benefits or effects, but the power of prayer has effects that reach into the life of the church. Peter was representative of the church. Peter is representative of the next phase of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Peter was the representation of the next ministry phase of the church. So when Cornelius is over there praying, God gets word to Peter who's over there. God sends word to Peter to let Peter know that he has now been enlisted by God to help somebody else 
find their footing, find better understanding, find a deeper relationship with God. So, 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 so prayer is not just what God does for me, but prayer simply means sometimes you are the answer to somebody's prayer unbeknownst to you. You are the answer to what somebody is waiting on. You have the answer to what somebody stands in need of. Now, why that's important, my brothers and sisters, is because when we understand this context of the story, when we understand how God was moving in Cornelius's life and how God's movement in Cornelius's life included Simon Peter to be a part of it, then we understand just how powerful prayer is. Again, quite often we only view the power of prayer as to how it benefits us, but the power of prayer not only has benefits for us, but it has responsibility assigned to us. Y'all just missed that right there. That sometimes the power of prayer is not in such a way where you gain anything tangible from it, but the power of prayer means you are now being called to help facilitate somebody else's next stage of understanding and next stage of living. Now, why is that important? Because that means that when you consider right now in this environment we live in, when you consider there are people who are being human trafficked, when you consider there are people who are struggling with abuse and addictions, when you consider the fact that there are people out here right now who are struggling with homelessness, when you consider the fact that there are children who are struggling with identity issues and identity crisis, when you, when you consider the fact that there are parents out here who are not quite sure how they're going to raise their kids and take care of their kids, and they are praying to a God they believe in, sometimes, hear me well, sometimes the, 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 the outcome of their prayer involves the participation of the church. Now, if the church understands just how powerful prayer really is, then we will come to a greater appreciation for our being involved, listen, in the lives of people, because it very well could be that our response, your response to somebody else's need is the direct result of the power of the prayer that they prayed. Help me somebody. It, you may not have prayed. I don't believe when I read the story, I don't believe that Peter prayed to have an impact in Cornelius's life, but Cornelius prayed for somebody to impact his life. And God said, I'm going to send you to Peter. I want you to look at yourself whenever you get a chance tonight in the mirror or tap yourself and say, God has sent for you. Your presence right now simply means that God has sent for you as an outcome to the power of somebody else's prayer. Help us tonight, amen. So, so, so not only do we see that the church, the church sometimes is the answer to somebody's prayer, but I want you to understand something else about the power of prayer, that God chooses to answer whom God chooses to answer. That, that, now that may miss, mess you up right there because Cornelius was on the outside. Cornelius was on the fringes, if you will. Cornelius was not somebody who came to Third Baptist Church. Cornelius was not somebody who worshiped at Third Baptist Church. Cornelius was somebody who Peter would deem as the enemy. Amen. Because he was a Roman, a Roman officer, a Roman army officer. He was somebody who inflicted or who it perpetuated Roman government rule. <laughs> Amen. So he wasn't somebody that Peter probably would have had dinner with. Amen. So, so, but what you see is that the power of prayer simply says that God chooses who God wants to answer. Now, now why that's important again for us is because we don't determine, we, we don't determine who, who, prayers get answered. We don't determine how God responds or if God should respond to somebody's prayers. We, we can't determine that. Only God can determine or choose by God's sovereignty to answer the prayers of the people 
that God chooses to answer. Now, that, that, that can be very problematic because if somebody approaches you and somebody comes to you and, 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 and they say that, you know, um, I've been praying and I believe that this is where I'm supposed to be, da, 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 da. And, and, but they're not somebody of your liking. They may not be somebody of your uh, persuasion. They may not be somebody who views life the same way you view life, but they've been praying that God might help them journey in their relationship with God, okay? See, we could not tell Cornelius what his relationship with God looked like. It would be easy for Peter to say, no, you, now here's the thing. Cornelius was not circumcised, okay? When you look at the Jewish custom, it was Jewish custom and Jewish culture to be circumcised. Circumcision represented or gave, gave credence to your relationship with God because there was this blood covenant that was being shared. Amen. Cornelius was Roman. He did. He was not circumcised. So because he wasn't circumcised, you would the church would say, well, you don't belong to God. You, you can't be in relationship with God because you have not gone through the proper channel. <laughs> there it is right there. And so it would have been easy for Peter to say, I don't want to have anything to do with you. But when the spirit of God apprehended Peter and sent him down there, what it says to us is that God then took control of Peter's movement because God wanted Peter where God wanted Peter. God wanted Peter to be in a place where God could help somebody who prayed to God for some, so for some assistance in his journey. Peter had to be where God wanted him to be which is whenever you find yourself being led to go somewhere and led to do something that you probably would not do on your own volition, you have to understand that as the power of God now taking control of your life to move you to where not where you necessarily want to be, but where God needs you to be. So God chooses to answer the prayers of those whom God chooses to answer. God could have, if God wanted to, he could have ignored Cornelius altogether and just said, yo, you are not Jewish. Yo, you are not in the in crowd. Yo, you, you don't even go to church. Why am I going to answer your prayer? But what it shows us is, again, is that God, God is in relationship with people who may not be in relationship with you and I. <laughs> okay, so get to the text. Verse number uh, uh, 21, Peter went down and said, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? They said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He's a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so he can hear your message. There's something in Peter's mouth that Cornelius needs to hear. Can I tell you something tonight? That there's, there's a message in your mouth that somebody, needs to hear that there, there is a message, a divine message in your mouth that somebody is waiting to hear. The question is, are you going to share the message or are you going to keep it to yourself? So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day he went with them accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and he called together his relatives and close friends. Listen, in verse 25, as Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell down his feet and worshiped him, but Peter pulled him up and said, stand up. I'm a human being just like you. Now, now that's important to understand because Peter in the moment recognized, he, he recognized yeah, there's nothing different between you and I. There's nothing different. Don't treat me as if I'm different than you because I am the same person just like you are who's still struggling in their understanding of God. Well, how do you know that reverend? Because Peter says, I've never eaten anything unclean. God says, don't you dare call, call what I've made unclean. He's struggling in his relationship with God. He's going to see another man who is not like him somebody on the outside who's also struggling 
with his relationship with God. Well, how do you know that, Reverend? Because Cornelius summoned for Peter to tell him the message that was in Peter's mouth. So there was something about Cornelius's relationship with God that Cornelius had to have worked out. There was something about Peter's relationship with God that had to be worked out. Can I tell you something tonight? Each and every one of us has something about our relationship with Almighty God that needs to be worked out. And it's only worked out through our own prayer time. God help us tonight. It's only worked out through our own commitment to prayer. There's some stuff about you and me that will only be worked out through our prayer life. If you don't have a prayer life, if I don't have a prayer life, if we collectively don't have a prayer life, the things that need to be worked out will not be worked out because there is power in prayer. Okay? So, 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 Peter says, stand up, man. I'm just like you, I'm a human being. So they talked together and went inside. Now look at verse 28, because it, it, it tells you again, Peter's mindset, it tells you again, Peter's uh, 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 paradigm, if you will. You know it is against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. Okay, it's against the Jewish law for me to be in your house and you're a Gentile. It was also against Jewish law, Peter, for you to be in the house of somebody who had dead animals around. You see the, pre the, the prejudicial, the prejudice side of the story, the prejudice slant that is in the story. It was fine for him to be with somebody of his own kind, even though the environment he was in was not agreeable to Jewish law. But it was not good for him to be in the house of somebody who was not of his own kind. When both places represented an unclean act contrary to the Jewish law. <laughs> I told you, prayer helps all of us work some stuff out in our lives, amen. We, we all need some stuff worked out in our lives, amen. He says, look, I ain't supposed to be in here, but this is why I'm here. Don't get it twisted. God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Now, that, my brothers and sisters, is a revelation that the church needs to have in this hour. That revelation right there, that God, he said, God has shown me. Verse 28, 28B clause, God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. That is a revelation for the church in 2023. We have erected our own religious totems. We have erected our own religious prejudicial totems. And we have adhered to them, believing that we are honoring our faith. But Peter says, I didn't come to this understanding on my own, but God has shown me that I should not think of anyone as unclean or impure. That the power of prayer helps us work out our own prejudicial issues. The power of prayer helps us come to a point in our own understanding where we realize that God is the only one, the only determining factor over whether or not somebody's life is worthy or unworthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter says, look, I, I, don't, I don't hang with these kind of folk. <laughs> I don't deal with those people over there. I don't associate with people who do those kind of things. I, 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 don't, I don't fraternize with folk who don't go to church. <laughs> I wanna help you understand something, my brothers and sisters tonight, because God called Peter from an unclean place and then instructed Peter 
to go to what he deemed as an unclean place. God called Peter out of Simon the Tanner's house and told Peter, I want you to go down to Cornelius' house. He perceived Cornelius' house as unclean, but could not understand or perceive that the place he was in was unclean. Can, can I tell you something? This is a, a reminder for all of us tonight. God has called us out of some unclean places. And please don't forget where God and what God called you out of. If God has called you from some unclean places, and then God sends you to a place that you deem or you view as unclean. Don't forget the fact that the very person that God may be sending you to, you are the answer to their prayer. You are, you, you are the outcome to the prayer that they prayed to their God. You, you are the outcome to the prayer they lifted up to God. This, this story is full of contradictions. It is for Peter's refusal to eat meat that he said was unclean. He's staying in the house of somebody that's unclean. That, that, that is Peter, the believer, the follower. Can I help you? Can I help you? You don't mind, do you? Can, 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 can I help you? Your life and mine is a life full of contradictions. We move in relationship with a God and we ourselves are full of contradictions. <laughs> we, we have contradictory lifestyles. We have contradictory thought paradigms. We have contradictory responses. We have contradictory actions. We have contradictory behavior. We, we are walking contradictions at times to the God that we follow. We, 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 are, we are the epitome of a contradictory statement when it comes to our relationship with God. Cornelius never should have for all intents and purposes, if things were to stay the way things were prior to Jesus, Peter, Cornelius rather, never would have had the experience of being in conversation with God. All things remaining the way they were, Cornelius never would have had the opportunity to have Peter come and talk to him. Cornelius, an outsider, feared God, was committed to prayer, prayed to God. God received his prayers and his giving, listen, as an offering. I would ask you tonight, in the recesses of your mind, have you ever considered does God receive my prayers and my giving to the poor? Does God receive them as an offering that I give to God? I'm in the church. I'm, I'm in, I, I am somebody who says I am in the church. But does God really receive my prayers, and giving as a statement of God's pleasure with me. Cornelius prayed. God responded. He sends Cornelius to Peter. Peter is the response, is the answer to somebody's prayer. You are, I am, we are the answer to somebody's prayer because there's power in prayer. And the power of prayer Sometimes does not mean God gives you what you want. 
The power of prayer sometimes means God enlists you for what God wants. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight. We honor you and we bless you and we give you the glory, praise. Let's do your name. Help us now, O oh Lord. Help us, O oh God, to have our own reckoning with you. Because sometimes we're just like Peter. We don't always see where we are. We don't always see what we're in. We don't always see what we're doing. We're quick to say what we don't do, but we don't always realize what we are doing. Help us, O oh God, to be answers to somebody's prayer. Help us, O oh God, to understand the power that is found in prayer. That we might not only believe you're going to do it for us, but we also understand that you might send us in response to the power of a prayer. Bless us now. <clears throat> in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look, my brothers and sisters, I want you to join us Thursday mornings, 7 o'clock a.m. First and fourth Sundays at 9 o'clock a.m. First Mondays of the month, 12 o'clock noon. How do you join us? You dial 667-770-1476. Put in the code 290035, pound sign. Join us for prayer every Thursday morning at 7 o'clock a.m. And we'll see you there. You be blessed. You be at peace.